Luke Baker, welcome to Apollo's Water. Thank you. Great to be here. So here we go. Are you ready for the Fast Five? I'm ready. Okay. Being in Honduras, you've been in Central and South America. What is the best Latin food that you love the most? Oh, you know, Honduras food. Uh, let's see. I guess either pupusas from El Salvador, or if you're really an insider, you might know what a baleada is in Honduras. I'll go what, are, what are those? To get, you got Baleadas, it's a... Uh, so it's from the north coast of Honduras, and it's a, a, a white flour tortilla, a bigger one with crema. It's like a sour mm. cream sort of thing, and and yeah, refried beans folded together. Mm. Simple and delicious. That sounds really, really good. Uh, being that you traveled quite a bit, being with what you do, the best place to travel is where the and why? Best. I What was the last thing you said? The best place to travel is where and why? Oh, well, yeah, I'm, uh, I love mountains. I grew up, I was the son of a uh, camp director. My father directed a Christian boys camp in upstate New York. So, um, yeah, I love the, uh, I mean, I live in California, but, but I would say the Cascades in the Northwest would be my favorite mountains. Great place to go. Mm. All right. Number three. The strangest food you've ever eaten is what and why? Oh, strangest food. And again, strange to your cultural background. Yeah, I understand yeah, so, everybody's got their culture. So I'm trying, I'm grasping, you know, like there must have been something weird in Ethiopia, but I'm not remembering. But what, so this was a strange eating experience. Let me go with that. Okay. So I, I was, uh, for one week, so I taught at a, uh, and Anabaptist Mennonite Seminary in Central America. Um, and it was, you know, the professors traveled rather than the students. So they would send us off to different countries and the students would come together for a week. So I was in Panama, um, right at, the, I mean, the literal end of the Pan American Highway. So this is like, you get to there, it's Yavisa. And after that, it's jungle, the Darien, like we're reading about now, with, you know, the immigrants coming through. Um, so I was there. And so these were indigenous um uh, students coming from uh, Wonan and Embera people, and they pulled up in their dugout canoes for the week of this course, and they um, and they brought the food for the week, and so they were unloading, you know, these they're, these big um, things of plantains, platanos, and fish and stuff, and and we just ate the same thing, you know, every meal, um, and so sometimes the platanos were were ripe and what I would consider delicious. Sometimes they're pretty green and they boil them and hard, but the thing fish just at like every meal. And that's not, yeah, like I'm an oatmeal in the morning guy, you know? So it just, <laughs> it just, yeah. Fish at every meal, it, 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 it weared on me. How many, how many days are we talking here? It was a week. That's a long time to have the same thing every yes. single morning. And they were, it, it, it was so cute. There was this, there was this one guy who, he he kind of looked out for me and he kind of sit next to me at every meal and you know help me and yeah he he protected me from having to eat the fish head of what you know that so that's where I didn't didn't get into weird strange but it was just yeah a lot of fish <laughs> okay how about this one number four if you were an airline what airline would you be and why wow what airline? Yeah, well, you know, Southwest is image is damaged a bit at the moment, but I was just on Southwest a, a couple of weeks ago. And I, yeah, I'm, I'm an efficiency lover, frugal. Um, so, but, but hopefully, you know, with some quality get you there. So I, I'll go mm. with Southwest. Southwest has normally been, for me, it's an adventure. I never know what I'm going to get. I mean, it can be crazy. There's sometimes the flight attendants are just so funny and yes, it's, it's just relaxing and you want to be relaxed on a flight. You just want to yep. be able to relax, but Hey, okay. Number five, if you could pick a sport that most represents you, it would be what and why? Huh. Well, I, um, yeah, it's hard for me to not think, well, what sports? Yeah. So really I was, I'm not very big. Um, 
maybe you can tell that from the video or not. But so, yeah, I, I aspired to be a football player. That wasn't the card. So I ended up getting into rock climbing. Um, so that immediately came to mind. But but again, going with my frugality, I'm a cross country skier and and I, you know, I go downhill every once in a while. But the getting out into the wilderness, um, I yeah, I have an appreciation for wilderness and a bit of an adventure getting off the trail. Um, so I'll go with cross country skiing. I like that. That's a great description. That's a, that's a really good description. Just kind of like get off the trail, be in nature, explore life. And it sounds like you've done that a lot. And so let's hear a little bit about your bio, where you grew up, your faith journey and what you're doing now. Okay. So I already mentioned that my father was a camp director and that was, that was really influential. And the, the, um, the approach of this camp, my father's philosophy it was in an organization called Christian Service Brigade, which sort of like a Christian Boy Scouts. Um, and the philosophy of the camp was, I mean, to do well by the campers, but it was really a training place for, you know, the high school counselors. And so discipleship by doing, and that really shaped me. Um, and then I, I went to um, Wheaton College, a double majored in social science and also Christian education. And both of those reinforced that sense of learning by experience, learning by doing. Um, and um, I headed off after Wheaton to taught in a bilingual school in Honduras, and I was the chaplain of the high school, sort of youth ministry within that school. And that was a really, yeah, shaping, transformative experience for me in a whole number of ways. Um, did that for four years, uh, came back to the United States and worked with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Um, in upstate New York at Syracuse University in Cornell, uh, got married in that time. And during the summers, my wife and I took students back to Honduras, IV InterVarsity students for a couple of months. Then we went to seminary after that um, and went back to Honduras, uh, worked with the Honduran equivalent of InterVarsity uh, for a few years, and then uh, went and did my doctorate in theology at um, Duke University. So we were in North Carolina for four years, and then again back to Honduras. And in that time was when we became Mennonites. So we returned to Honduras with uh, Eastern Mennonite Mission and did a variety of things, including teaching the, the Panama thing I just mentioned. And uh, we have two daughters. One was four months old when we went to Honduras. The other one was born in Honduras. And um, yeah, and after that stint in Honduras, then I got hired to teach at a Mennonite Brethren Seminary here in Fresno, California, and have been here since 1999. Um, and I like to mention, I mean, I stay in touch with Latin America, go most summers for a week or two. Um, haven't been since COVID, but we're going back in June for a couple of weeks. And also, I lead a Bible study in the so this afternoon, um, for, yeah, this is Friday. I don't know when this will actually show or people listen to it. But for me, it's a Friday. And in a few hours, instead of talking to you, I will be in, you know, I'll be in the Fresno County Jail leading a Bible study. So I do that every Friday. Mm. Well, that, that's a pretty incredible story. Are there a lot of Mennonites in Fresno, California? Um, yes, there are actually. So, um, you know, there are different sort of Mennonite what would you say, hubs or meccas, Jerusalems. And so, you know, sort of Lancaster, Pennsylvania is one. And then in the Indiana and Ohio, you know, like Elkhart, Goshen, Winnipeg. But yes, uh, so Kansas. So a lot of Mennonites settled in Kansas as refugees. And then they, you know, looked for land and, and a bunch landed in the Central Valley of California. So there are a fair number here. No, my my hometown was a small farming community. We had fourteen churches, nine were Mennonite. So wow. I get, I get, I get exactly because um, uh, we were in heart of Illinois Amish country. So yeah. had a lot of Mennonites that were around us. A lot of my friends were Mennonite. So growing up, I'm very familiar. That's why I was I was curious. I just didn't know about California. Yeah, and you wouldn't you wouldn't run into. I mean, there's a there are a few of the more sort of conservative old order kind of things here in California, but it would not. Yeah, it, it would not be like that Illinois, Indiana, Central Pennsylvania, or Ontario experience of buggies and that. That that sort of Mennonite you wouldn't encounter here in Central California. Yeah, old, old school, old school. We right. had a spectrum. There was even a spectrum of the, I mean, for crying yes. out loud, we had nine churches that were Mennonites. So there was a spectrum. I can imagine. Of Mennonites. Yes. 
from black bumper beachyites <laughs> all the way all the way around. So um, it's just interesting, you know, to be able to encounter different groups and different backgrounds and all that, which actually leads to your book. And I wanted to talk about this book, Centered Set Church, Discipleship and Community Without Judgmentalism. And I, I, I was really drawn to this book because uh, we're going to get that to a minute, uh, exactly because of Paul Hebert. We're going to talk about him. But what made you write this book? The reason that propelled me, I mean, one is, yeah, so, so I'm passionate about the, the concept itself from Paul Hebert, and I've taught it in my ethics class for, yeah, for 24 years now, and, and I found it very, very helpful for students. But commonly in class, after I'd present the ideas, um, the concepts, a student would say something like, okay, Mark, this is really good, so I'm really attracted to this centered approach, but what do you do when? And they would ask me some situation, or, well, how about membership in a centered church, or those what-if kind of questions, and and I didn't have the answers. And, uh, you know, I could draw back to a few things from my ministry experience at the university or something, but I had, I didn't, I wasn't working with the paradigm at that time. So I just say, yeah, I don't know. And after a while, I thought, you know, oh, and there was no resource I could point people to, which is, you know, usually the case. Like, I mean, that's what professors were sort of walking bibliographies, right? And so you say, oh, well, go read this or go do that. And so then I just came to a point where saying, I, um, I'm going to write this resource that's not there. So it is. So I work hard in the beginning of the book at explaining the concepts, but you know, really about two thirds of the book is putting it into practice. How do you live this out? And mm. that's what motivated me to write it. Well, let's go back for our audience so they know what we're talking about. Yes, exactly. We're talking about centered set. So let's define those. We've got three. We have the the bounded set and the fuzzy set, and then the centered set. So describe those three for us, because some of my people right now are going, what are you talking about? I have zero idea yes. what you're referring to, but you will. Just a moment. Just stay with us. And and uh, Mark's going to explain to us. Okay. So let me um, let me start briefly with the story, as, and this is the same way I start the book, to say, here's, you know, Mark Baker, six years old, riding home from church, northern new jersey um looking out his window sees somebody uh you know is out there mowing their lawn and i think oh they're not a christian or at least they're not a good christian why well they weren't in church this morning and they're working on sunday they shouldn't be working okay so what was i doing in that moment um i was drawing a line between myself and my family good christians and this other person not and what I was doing is what Paul Hebert would call a bounded group or a bounded set. So Paul Hebert, missiologist, missionary in India, came up with these things, borrowed them from mathematics. Yeah, and it's kind of a tame thing there. You know, look at this six-year-old, that's cute. But it, I, mean, I continued and I got into high school and it's this list of rules, you know, don't drink, dance, smoke. And, and I look judgmentally at other people who, who were doing these things and I wasn't. And again, think of myself, I'm a good Christian. They're not Christians. So um, this is a this is a very visual concept. And I would in, invite uh, listeners to go to centeredsetchurch.com. And that's uh, my website I have for this. And if you scroll down to the second screen there, there's a thing that says, I think it says free PDF diagrams or something like that. And so if you just hit pause, go get that sheet, and then we'll come back and I'll unpack them for you. So what Hebert says is, and again, barring this from math, applying it to, to groups, um, and I'll just go right to churches. So a bounded church is a church that, oh, sorry. And this, the central question in this is, how does a group define who belongs? And Hebert says there's different ways of doing this. So a bounded group comes up with the criteria, and it can be beliefs, behaviors, um, other things, and they say, this is what is required to be part of this group. And then that becomes a line. And anyone who's inside on the right side of that line is in, belongs to the group, and someone outside doesn't. Um, and as in my example, so that's what I was doing. Yeah, I, I was drawing this line. And so for my bounded set church, you know, it was 
yeah, you, you need to not work on Sunday. And then later it was, you know, don't drink, sman don't drink, dance, smoke, et cetera, um, steal on the job, things that other people were doing. And so I had this line. But as I mentioned, bounded sets, they, they bounded churches have a tendency towards judgmentalism. Um, and there's this sense of in and out and superiority, and also it can tend to breed shame of of uh, both, I mean, those people that are outside can feel the shame, but also people on the inside, if we trip mess up, then we feel shame. And um, so in reaction to this, this judgmentalism, some people go the way of what Hebert called a fuzzy church. And so this is to look at, hey, this, this judgmentalism is no good. We've got to get rid of it. And so you recognize, well, this line is the problem. This is, this is, you know, this, we're drawing lines, big judgment. Let's get rid of it. So you erase the line. And then what happens is the group becomes fuzzy. There's not a clear sense of who belongs, who doesn't belong, or even sort of what the group is about. And um, so it takes care of one problem, the judgmentalism, but it creates others. The, the group lacks identity. And the, in a fuzzy church, there's, there's really not much of a way to call people to conversion because, you know, what are you calling them to? Um, and, and there's certainly, you know, tolerance is a high virtue in a fuzzy group, but not much, you know, loving confrontation or you know, journeying with people because that would be against the way of a fuzzy church. But Hebert said he offered a, a totally different approach. So bounded and fuzzy are sort of on the same um on a continuum, and one has this, this strict line, the other is fuzzy. So Hebert says, well, there, there's a, a totally different way of thinking about who belongs, and that's looking at orientation or relationship with the center. So in a centered church, rather than having a line, it establishes a center and says, this is who we are, this is what's important to us. So for simplicity and for you know sake of agreement, we say, Jesus Christ is our center, and so if someone is heading toward the center, they belong to the group. So we're looking at the person and not saying, are they mowing their lawn on Sunday or not? We're looking at, are they heading toward Jesus? Are they heading toward the center? And if they are, then they belong to the group. If they're heading away, they don't. So it's about orientation and relationship. Um, and still there's space there to talk about um, behavior and beliefs. If we think someone's out of line, we'll come along beside them and say, you know, hey, that doesn't line up with who we are. But there's not this pressure of you're out, I'm in shaming because we are, we're all in process towards the center. And just, yeah, briefly, I'll stop with this. Where is the security line? So in a bounded church, the security is in the line. And it's, a bounded church can say we centered on church, we center on Christ. I, you know, many most churches do, but the reality is their their attention is pulled toward that line because that's where their security is. Whereas a centered church, our security is in the center. I mean, that's what makes me part of this group. That's where, yeah, my security is in the center. So it it draws my attention toward the center. So bounded, uh, fuzzy, and center. So you give a story in the book as to, to illustrate this, because I think it's still a little bit fuzzy for some yeah. of our people to understand that, because, you know, you're talking in terms, but when you talk in story, as you've already alluded to and shown us, it helps us to put meat on it to really see it in our experience. You mentioned, I think you were in Honduras and you were talking to this woman who was married to her husband and where was he at? Is it, it, it am I getting the story right? Yes. It, it yeah. so, so tell, I, tell that story for us. Yeah. And let me, let me uh, just back up a, uh, just a paragraph in the book to say, okay, why did I tell this story? Because, okay, so I just said a fuzzy church is fuzzy and is not as, you know, strict on ethics and beliefs, things like that. And people in a bounded church can feel like, yeah, we don't want to go to this centered thing because our beliefs matter. These behaviors matter, important. And what I advocate is that a centered church actually can have can lead to more profound transformation in discipleship than a bounded one. So a bounded feels strict, but it tends to be superficial. So what I what I talked about is in Honduras, um, 
Yeah, there's common law marriage is very, very common in Honduras, in, in part because of finances and people can't afford to have a party and reception, but other reasons as well. And churches, both Catholic and Protestant, emphasize strongly people getting legally married. And, and that's a good thing. And I'm in favor of that. Um, but what happens is, OK, so it's a bounded church. So and this church where, where I've been working with, um, they had people that were not legally married. And so those people, they're, they're, they're on the wrong side of the line. So they couldn't be members. They couldn't participate in the Lord's Supper. They couldn't be leaders in the church. They're outside. And, and the church I was working with, they didn't go this far, but, but I, I've been in some other churches where they would, you know, and it's, and it's generally women, um, that they would call them, you know, fornicators. And, and so just think, this, this person, they're not legally married, so yeah, so officially they're fornicators. So this church I was working with, we read Galatians together, and we, we, we said, okay, we want to step away from this bounded group way of doing things. And so they take this on. Um, and so what they decided to do, so now they're centered and they're looking at these, they're these three women in their church that weren't legally married, have been attending all the time. And so they're saying, okay, well, what does it mean to be centered? And what the, the, the elders leaders of that church says, well, we need to go and talk with these women. We see that they're we're talking in terms of the diagram. We see their arrow is headed towards the center. But they are in this situation that we think is inappropriate. They 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 should be legally married. So that so I, I tell the story. The leaders go and visit this woman to discern. And I was right there. I mean, just to feel the difference. If they're in a bounded church, they don't have to do that. She's not legally married. She's out. That's all we need to do. But a centered church is going to walk with the person, discern what's going on. So I, I talk in the book of, you know, qualities of a centered church, of compassion, curiosity. So they're going in. So they talk to this woman and, and as they, they, yeah, they, they interact with her, they find um, she and her common law mayor, uh, husband have been together for, I think it was 17 years. And they, at least she had been faithful to him. I don't, he wasn't a believer. I'm not sure about him. But, you know, they've been in a, in a faithful relationship together for raised children together. And she said to the church leaders, you know, I want to get married. I agree it's the right thing to do. But my common law husband refuses. He won't get he won't get married. Um, and so and the leaders asked more questions, explored their relationship. OK, so now fast forward a little bit. The leaders leave her house. They're standing on the, the street in front of her house talking about the situation. And one of the men says, you know, she may not be legally married, but her relationship with her common law marriage, with her common law husband, you know, it's actually better than my relationship with my wife, legally married wife. And what happened from that, that encounter with that woman is, is two things. One, they decided, we think this woman is headed towards Jesus. She's part of us. And they invited her to start taking communion today, or at least last time I was in Honduras, she was on the church council. Like she's in now. They discerned, yes, she's in. But here I think was the beautiful thing is the leaders, how did they respond to that? They said, we think we need to work on our marriage relationships. So what came out of that was they they did a series. They looked around at the church. Who's the couple in here who has the best relationship? And they asked them to lead a series of studies for other couples in the church on improving their marriage relationship. So the centered approach, um, it's messier. It takes more work, uh, but it yeah it it opens up possibilities for that are complex for like this woman. And I'd argue the potential of deeper transformation because you get past just the superficial rules. It, illustrating that there was a almost an exact situation at uh, the church we were at, the, the last church we were at uh, before where we're at now. And the, the husband had become a believer in Jesus, but his wife wouldn't marry him. And they were pretty much common law. There were four children. And I know pastors would say, you know, you can't be in that situation. I actually, no, some people said, we won't baptize you. You're, you're, you're not going to be baptized. 
but here is a man that said, if I leave, I'm leaving my wife, really the woman who's been my life for 14 years and my children, which would be more detrimental. And, and our elders said the same thing. They came back and they said, he's in process. He's moving that way. It would be bad for you to, to, to leave. We think that would be worse. We want you to stay and continue to grow in your relationship with God. And that's what happened. And then she became a believer in Jesus mm -hmm. through that. And then they had this, they got married and they had this amazing marriage. But in a world today, especially as we're encountering more and more of this in our churches, the, that bounded and fuzzy part, I think, um, and the centered part becomes much more important to see. We've seen the fuzzy, we've seen the bounded, but very few people have seen the centered. Now, some would say, and I, and I know just in conversations with several people, they'd say, well, our church doesn't do it that way. It's bounded. You give another story of a woman who was in a bounded church and she was for all purposes, I mean, she was legally married, but her marriage wasn't very good. If I remember correctly, they weren't even living in the same place. Can you tell a little bit of that story? Yeah, and it, it's actually from the, the same neighborhood as this other church. So um, this was when I, I was doing um, research for my dissertation. So I was interviewing people in different churches, and I was trying to get a sense of um, yeah, I, I did actually at the time I didn't unfortunately have the language of bounded and centered, but that's what I was working at. So, and one of the things, one of the questions I asked people was, what does um, what's it mean to be a member in good standing? So that's in, in the Spanish they'd say un miembro pleno, like a member in good standing in your church. So I'm talking to this woman, and. Um, who, who I didn't know, like I just got connected to her from someone else in the neighborhood. I'm, I'm interviewing her and she proudly tells me, yes, I'm, you know, I'm a member at my church and I teach Sunday school. And I said, I said okay, so what, you know, like what are the requirements? And she said, well, so for membership, you have to be baptized. Um, and, um, you know, if you're, if you're not single, you need to be legally married. And then there was something else, which I'm not remembering. And she, again, affirms, you know, she's a member in good standing. She teaches Sunday school. Um, so then I go through the rest of the interview and we're, we're sitting like in, in front of her house, do the interview. And then, yeah, back to what I said about airlines and stuff. So, I, yeah, I'm, I'm efficient and I'm thinking, OK, Mark, time is short. You know, why don't you ask to talk to her husband as well? You can get two interviews out of this same visit, you know. So I innocently ask, oh, could I talk to your husband as well? And she turns to me and says, um, uh, no, actually, yeah, he doesn't live here. He he lives over with his mother. And and so, like, I, I'm not there to, you know, do marital counseling. So I'm backing up, like, fine, you know, I'm ready to go. But she keeps talking and she says, yeah, she said, you know, it just doesn't work. When we're together, like, it's just like cats. We fight all the time. And she said, and I, I like, his mother, I can't stand her. Like, I can't live there. And, you know, it's just... So what I observed was the, the, the contrast between these two examples. She's a member in good standing. Her marriage is a mess. But in, in a bounded group, there's a tendency um, because we, we, we need the security of being in. So we make rules, uh, uh, characteristics, um, criteria, there's the word, that we can meet. And so here's this rule, you have to be legally married and she meets the rule, so she's she's in, she's okay. But that church was not working with her to, to, to save, to improve her marriage because she met the requirement. So that, that gets at that sense that I think, um, you know, bounded can be, it has an air of strictness, but it can be superficial. And then I think I, I, to, what, to, to what you alluded to, I think it's important to bring in fuzzy as well. Like a fuzzy just wouldn't even, you know, like, oh, we're not going to talk about yeah. it. We don't, you know, we don't make this person feel bad or that's their thing, not our thing. So, um, but the centered offers the potential of, well, the sort of thing that you described that happened in your church. Well, that allows for process. And that's something that I don't think we do very well with. We want the we want the light on and light off. It was dark yeah. and then it was light. And I tell some people that is their salvation story. They, it, they were in darkness and they were in light. But other people, it's like a dimmer switch and it's in process. And we're going to encounter more and more of this, I think, as our culture continues to 
uh, I want to say devolved, but moves away from the Judeo-Christian framework, yeah. and 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 we're going to see more and more of this. So process becomes more and more important. But it also means there's, a, as you said, it's very very messy, and some people don't like messy. We want things to be clean, even if it's just on the surface. We want it to be clean. Like my wife and I get into this discussion about our house all the time. She's like, I asked you to clean. I'm like, it is clean. Look around. And and everything's put away. Everything's folded. She she means like scrub, dust. She wants that part of it. So we have these two definitions of clean. I think it's very similar with churches. It, on the outside, it looks great. But when you probe down deep, that's where you find ma- massive problems. And, and I've seen this. We've all seen this. Anybody that's been in any type of ministry, we've seen this. But it does bring a lot of it questions a lot of our paradigms, getting back to the bounded part. And you mentioned interacting with your students. And when I was reading your book, you go through a lot of things that frankly made me uncomfortable at first. I went, okay, what's this situation? What's he going to do here? And you, you start off in part one of defining the paradigms and nothing there. Foundation of a Christ-centered church, discipleship in communities where it gets really messy. But it was in chapter eight, I felt like there was a really hit your stride. And I started seeing a lot of the different elements that you were talking about with people, bringing it out, this idea of, because you allow for vulnerability. I mean, if you go to a church today and you ask, is your church vulnerable? Now, there is a, a larger group of people being vulnerable. My question is, is how do we juxtapose vulnerability with, again, you might be vulnerable on the surface, but you use that as a ploy to just to, to say that I'm making a change and I'm not, you know, you know what I'm saying is, is that they, there's, there's always that danger. There's the part where you go, I met the external, but I don't have the internal. I can be vulnerable, but I'm using that as a smoke screen because I really don't want to change. And this, this is the issue. You're dealing with guilt. You're dealing with shame. You're dealing with these issues. And, and you mentioned moving away from shame and you've, you've written about this, but you also mentioned that there's two kinds of shame. And I was interesting when you first said, you know, you want to kind of get rid of this idea of shame and myself, I reacted, I like, you don't want to get rid of all shame. There's a right. healthy shame yes. and you called it integrative. I think shame is the term and yeah. then disintegrative. Disintegrative. Shame. Yes. Yeah. Can you, can you explain those two different types of shame that are being employed when we're talking about this centered set idea. Yes. And so I'm, I'm, yeah, obviously those are, yeah, more technical, big words. I borrowed those from social scientists. I didn't make that up, but, um, and yeah, and just to affirm you. And so like, yeah, the book I co-authored with Jason, you know, Ministry and Honor Shame Content. I mean, that was a key thing for us is that there are things that are shameful. So there, it's, you know, shame is appropriate at times. Um, but then how do you respond to it? So disintegrative shame is when there's a spirit of uh, stigmatizing the person. So you're shaming them and and it's, yeah, with... Non-redemptive. Yeah, the, the, you're, you're not concerned with their restoration. You're, and, mm. and this is, I mean, I'm just, I'm talking. Yeah, that's why I, I pause. It's just like bounded just leaps at me. The, in a bounded church, the line is more important than the person. Okay, and, and I'm careful, you know, that's a general statement. That's not true in every situation. But, right, right, but right. the tendency in a bounded church is to prioritize the line over the person. And so disintegrative shaming is when you shame a person and you're not seeking the person's restoration, you stigmatize them and it prioritizes something else. And so to me, I, when you asked the question, I just immediately thought Pharisees and Jesus. So mm-hmm. the Pharisees practice disintegrative shaming and they're their you know crusade their method for achieving holy holiness was to shame people and they are they are more focused on the rules okay now integrative shaming is it it still may cause the person shame but the but the goal is to restore the person so galatians 6 1 you know Paul says, if someone amongst you is singing, sinning, then, you know, those among you spiritual brothers and sisters, you know, restore them, talk to them with gentleness. And be careful, lest you yourself are tempted. 
That's yes. in that part of it too, because right. they're, they're, but for the grace of God, go I, you, right. you know, but so anyway, keep going. I just and want to make sure I added so, that part of that. So I think, um, and I think of, uh, yeah, I mean, what, where I really like to talk about this is, um, and as a, just an example is L Luke seven of the, um, woman in the house of Simon the Pharisee. And so she has she has been shamed by her community in a disintegrative way. She, like she's trash, she's looked down upon, and Jesus is honoring her, lifting her up. But in the in the context of that story, you know, Jesus says to Simon, but look, but look, since I came in here, you know, you didn't wash my feet, you didn't greet me with a kiss, you didn't anoint my head with oil. Um that's a shaming move. I mean, he's he's calling Simon out. Um, so it it's he's putting a spotlight on here. But what's Jesus's intention? You know, he he doesn't um, he doesn't get get up and storm out. He is seeking for Simon the Pharisee to turn away from his ways because it would be better for him and the 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 community. So integrative shaming. Um, yeah, so a fuzzy set would not practice any, any kind of, of shaming. shaming. Well, not not intentionally, because you oh, mentioned correct. that right. th not there, is, there is a shame if you don't follow our tolerance virtue. Exactly. Then there yeah. is a form of shame. It's just yes. a different kind. Anyway, keep going. Yeah, no, and actually, um, in when when I, the first draft of the book, I had um, eight or nine practitioners read over it and give me input. And a couple of them who had more experience in fuzzy churches they argued that churches don't actually stay fuzzy very long because but the thing that yeah the, the one thing you can't do in a fuzzy church is to be judgmental but that in itself is judgmental so yes that's a that yeah got off track there a bit but yes i agree with you on that that there's that kind of shame but um but so, yeah, the fuzzy wouldn't, whereas in a centered, again, it would be call up. And if we go to where you started with, you know, this person with kind of this false vulnerability, I think that's why in a centered, we walk with people. Um, yeah, maybe, and I don't, yeah, and you can come back and ask it differently or say something. But what I thought of when you said that was when I started the book, um, okay, so I, I don't have the answers to my students' questions. So I went out and interviewed numerous pastors, church leaders, ministry leaders to ask them, how are you seeking to live out this centered approach? And what I imagined the book would be would be this collection of case studies. So, you know, here's this person, this situation, what's the centered approach? And then this next situation, this next situation. But very quickly, I mean, within the first three or four interviews I did, I realized, oh no, that's that's totally wrong thinking, Mark. Like there is not a centered approach to deal with this particular situation. And part of that is because of like you mentioned. So we have two people that are in the same kind of situation and one person is giving this sort of vulnerability about it, but you perceive it's false vulnerability. And another person is, you know, torn up repentant you're going to, in a centered church, you would have the necessity and the possibility of responding to those people in different ways. Well, it allows more for process. Yes. And that's, that's the part where being in, in pastoral ministry to see, like we had membership and it was very clear early on when you're, especially when you're a younger leader, who's in, who's out. And you have to make some decisions on what, what are those things that we're going to fight over? What are the things that we're going to have process? But as time went on, especially as we started interacting with different cultures, Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists, the, they would come to worship and they wanted to be a part of the community. And you wanted to say, okay, well, what do we allow for in this process? Or, or so many people coming in that were not married and they would, you know, they were living together. You'd want to give them, you, you want to call them to repentance, but they, they, they're not there yet. Right. And, and and it's this is the fluctuation. The question, though, that I think a lot of people ask, and I, I just know this from knowing our audience, some are going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus calls them to repent and they repent right away. Well, yes, but I, I don't think there is a one size fits all. I think that there are just Jesus deals with the heart and some he does call them to lay it down immediately right then where they're at. But there's other times he gives a bit of a process 
with them and allows them to work through that. And, and that's that's part of it. But it is something that I don't think there is a, always a one size fits all. I think that there is this, that this is grace. This is the danger of grace, you know, because grace is scandalous. There's mercy. This is God have mercy on me, a sinner. Um, and he's the one that goes home justified in the sight of God and not the man who goes, oh, I fast twice a week. I give a 10th of all that I have. And, and this makes it messy for a lot of people because they, they think, oh, we're becoming liberal or whatever they're becoming, whatever their terminology, their adjective is that they don't like and they're fearful of. But how do we, as we're doing this messy process, how do we hold on to the tenets of orthodoxy within a centered set, allowing people an opportunity to process, but knowing when that they are, they're stalling their obedience and they're saying, no, 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 I'm not going to cross that line. I'm not going to cross that line because I know as soon as I do it, for example, I'll, I'll just give you a quick illustration. We had a man who was at our church. And again, these are these case studies you talk about, you know, man who was at our church. He, he come from a, an addiction background came to know the Lord, slowly integrated small groups, became a member, was so proud, went on mission trips, was so grateful, was terribly lonely, terribly lonely. And so he wanted to to date. And he started dating ladies that we just said, these aren't women that are good for you. And here's yeah. why. But he refused to listen. And then he comes to us and he goes, you know, we moved in together. And it's like, well, okay. And he goes, and I've removed myself from membership. So you can't discipline me anymore. And it's like, well, wait a minute. No. And we had, we had this, you actually refer to this in the book. We had a yearly affirmation of membership. You would refer, reaffirm it yearly just so, you know, you, to remind you what you've committed to, to see if you're still in line with us where you're at. But he was removing himself because he was trying to remove himself from the discipline aspect. And I went, no, no, no. You, you, now you're hiding, you know, we're coming after you in, in, a, in a good way because we care about you and where you're at. But again, messy messy situations. And I don't know, very few situations do I find that are not messy. There's messy. always another story. But how, how do we help people call them to this holiness of life that God calls them to, allow room for process, but to know when we have to say no, no. And, and I don't want to say we go from centered to bounded. That's not it. Yeah. So yeah, a few different thoughts came up as I was listening to what you're saying there. So first of all, just the repentance is, um, I mean, that's a great centered word. Again, if, I mean, you look at the diagram, how are we determining whether people are part of this group or not? It's the direction of their arrows. And what is repentance? It's turning around. Um, so yeah, so if someone says, oh, Jesus called for repentance all the time, I'd say, amen. And you know, we do too. Um, and uh, yeah, actually, I, I was I was recently in a, a, a webinar talking about Centered Set Church. And and I will admit that the person that was talking, that, I mean, they were presenting as if they were very centered. And I was getting a little like, boy, I don't know, this feels a bit fuzzy to me, and I'm not sure. And so I pressed them and I said, Okay, but when, um, you know, there needs to be a time when people make a decision, you know, that to, to repent, to come to Jesus. So when, because the way he had talked about it, I didn't have that sense. And he said, oh, actually, we say that every week. We are, you know, what, what is your next step towards Jesus right now? What are you called to now? So I would... I would say, yeah, we centered set calls for repentance and and continually so in a way that abounded wouldn't because we recognize recognize the journey, the pilgrimage. Now, um, then the, the next thing I thought was, I might look at a situation and think, oh, this person needs to repent of X behavior, um, but something. I've learned from my own experience and talking to people in relation to this book is um, God may have different things in mind for what this person most needs to repent of right now. So yes, repent, but don't go in with my list of, and this is what you need to repent of clearly, but 
yeah, the sense of what is God doing in your life? What, what, where do you need healing? Where are you off track? Let the spirit work. Um, then the last thing I thought of saying in relation to, yeah, your question sort of when, um, and I think you, we can feel it in the story you said, is that um, there, if, if we're journeying with people, and so a, a situation like you described where the person is resistant and you are pressing and saying, no, I think this is out of line. It seems to me you were doing the appropriate thing in a centered way. And then how does the person respond? And they say, oh, okay, well, you, in essence, they're saying I'm out of here. I mean, they're not mm -hmm. That's exactly what literally happened. leaving, but, but they are, I mean, if we look at the diagram, they're just saying, you know, I'd like to now sort of officially turn my arrow the other way because I want to keep living that way. And then, and to feel that, it's not that you came along and said, bad person you are not a good like they said you're calling them to something they respond and so i think the calling walking with um is the most significant part which can include in your case did you explicitly saying you know i think this is not appropriate this isn't good for you and then how does the person uh respond and and yeah, I think they're, but I, so I think a lot of times people will self-select out and say, my arrow's the other way. But I, but I also want to be careful to say, I, there are times when we do need to say no, you know, like you are, and I think of immediately two examples in the book. One is where a person was actually, they were in a small group and they were acting in a very bounded way. And the group leader says, you know, we cannot, you, you must change your behavior in this group or leave because that is not who we are. So an ironic kind of thing. But I mean, in the sense that if he was in a bounded church, he would have been fine. But for them, it was like, one, well, we can't have that. And then also, I think in the chapter that where I talk about recovery ministry, yeah, there was a person who just was not doing their homework. And so they they said to them, you can stay in our church. We love you, but you cannot be in this program because if this program is going to work for you and others in it, you need to do these things. Mm. You know, it's interesting as you were talking, the parable came to my mind from Matthew 21 and sometimes called the parable of the two sons, not the prodigal, but it and it goes like this because I think this just gives room and support to your process. And I didn't see this reference in your book, but if you ever read an addendum, I think this would Thank be you. so good. But he says, what do you think about this? This is Jesus talking. A man with two sons told the older boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, no, I won't go, but later changed his mind and went anyway. Then the father told the son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will. And he, but he didn't go. Which of the two obeyed his father? They replied the first. Then Jesus explained his meaning. I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. Hmm. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him while tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. But it's interesting there. And I, I haven't looked at the the uh, context. I mean, it's, yeah. it's it says today, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. And he says, no. But then you see he does, you know, it's that process. And others say, hey, I'll do it. I'm going to do it all. But their hearts aren't right. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think it just comes back to and, and understanding that process. But again, I know some people are saying, well, how do you do, like, if, if my church values membership and how do we go about this? If someone says, hey, look at that guy, he's not doing it. Why can't I? And it comes back to that, that again, what's the heart? Are they in the, are they moving in the direction of Jesus? Do they recognize it? Are they saying, God have mercy on me a center? I know I screwed up. They're looking for grace, looking for restoration. Um, and I know some churches that don't do that. They, they will use shame as a weapon, not restorative. I talked to a young man uh, the other day and he was mentioning how uh, this one young woman um, ended up getting pregnant uh, not pregnant, but she got married and they got divorced. And then she she had told the church later that, you know, we had slept together before we got married and they brought her up and publicly shamed her. And I thought, what are you doing to this young woman who's already been broken? It's two wrongs aren't going to make a right. This doesn't seem the way of Jesus to me. Um, so how do we help people to see this? Because they think they're following the Lord. 
they're following what they think is the scriptural way. And they still don't understand this aspect of shame that instead of being a restorative and helping people back, that it's using to promote control, power, humiliation, trauma. How do we help people with that? Yeah. So first to say that is a great example of disintegrative shaming. So mm -hmm, back mm -hmm. to your previous question, that's disintegrative. Um, yeah, you know, Travis, I, so my hope is, so I, I may be overly optimistic about this, but I think, I think, Many people that are in bounded situations hold to their bounded ways because they are clear that the things that they believe are important and the behaviors that they affirm are important. And so they um and they're 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 bounded mentality. And you know, and it's not like even an example you gave, it's not like people are sitting in a back room, you know, Tuesday night elders meeting or something saying, okay, so how can we really shame this person? Like, that's what we're about is shaming people. So how can we shame people? Like, I don't, it's not, they're not leading with that. But, but I think the, the paradigm itself, if you have this, this idea that we have these rules, those criteria, we we have to enforce them. It takes you the way of shaming. So again, maybe naive, but my hope would be um, if the people from that church are you know listening to this today and think, huh, this sounds interesting. They get the book, you know, or you know, find out about this. I think, oh, there's a way that we can maintain our convictions, take things seriously, but avoid the shaming and judgmentalism. I, I have the hope that presenting an alternative is um, will enable people to see a way they can hang on to things that are important to them, but not have to shame. Well, I mean, it, again, it comes back to I mean, there's so many situations that there is not never a one size fits all approach, rarely. And 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 even then, I'd say that you're going to do it wrong before you do it right. I hope that's not the case, but I think we learn more from our mistakes than we do from all of our, our successes. I do know that people have an innate desire. I think a part of the imaging of God is to belong and people want to belong. And then they see this idea of belief. And I know other people say, hey, you believe before you belong. But we've we've had a lot of neuroscientists on the show. And they've shown now that we do belong. We seek to belong before we ever do believe. And it's the belonging that gives credence and enables us to believe. It creates really a plausibility structure for us to see it. Um, and it that's not to say we don't call people to belief. We do we just want to make sure that we love them and we care for them. And that helps them to, to see that. The hard part in our, for many of us that have grown up in what I call a high Christendom culture, is that you have the people that are already good in your mind with not the outright sin, but the inner sins that are hard to see. And we we have no problem with them belonging before they believe. Yeah. It's those that have the outward sin right. where it's much more obvious, whether it's someone who is perhaps you know transgendered, they're coming into your services dressed as one person, or you see two women coming in that are, you know, that are holding hands or whatever it might be in our contemporary situation. I mean, it could be anything, a man with four women, who knows? Yes. You know, in, a, in our, just our contemporary situation, there's no end to that. The harder part is, is giving people that room for process when there's a disruption, because some would say, OK, well, I know some are even saying to me right now, OK, Travis, you've gone too far because our church church is not for the unbeliever. It's for the believer. And I could say, OK, that's true to an extent. But to say not to say that it's not for the unbeliever, it's it's for the believer in that. Yes, we know Paul has set all this stuff up. But to think that the you're not going to encounter unbelievers on a Sunday morning, I think, especially in our cultural context, is is just naive. Mm -hmm. I, I really think it's naive, especially since we have so many people that are, quote unquote, deconstructing who may have grown up in church and they want to go back. But they're still a mess. They're still a mess in there in this process. How do we help maintain the purity of the body in this that Paul talks about 
And there is a judgment aspect. I mean, Paul says, you know, don't even eat with such a brother who's in sexual sin uh, in 1 Corinthians 5. And then yet at the same time, give room for process for people. And, and that was always the trouble, right? That was always the issue that we had. And we actually treated members differently when we did non-members. Still trying to be centered. But there was there was a point in time where we say we called them, they became part of the body. You're held to a higher standard sure. because so how do you how do you help and or what where have you seen perhaps that's worked well where they've been able to call people to that and give room for people to process at the same time? Yeah. So again, I think let's let's start with a negative example. So fuzzy is all about belonging, not like you, it would be okay to not believe. I mean, they can't say even sort of what are you supposed to believe? Um, but in the long run, it's not a great place to belong because it's so fuzzy. There's just, there's not security there. Um, okay. So that is not the way to go. And just to say it, to have things, have clarity on this is who we are, this is what we believe. And I say in the book, you know, defining your center is a very, very important part of this. Um, so, yeah, I think, and and I, I, I appreciate what you said about having a different standard. I mean, I think um, in the sense that, yeah, as people make commitment towards the center, then they're in a different situation they have said this is the journey i'm on i'm in this and i think the language itself is very important so uh one of the things that yeah that i that i advocate in the book is or make the observation a leader cannot do this by himself or by herself so if you're leading a small group you read the book and say okay i got to be centered you can't do it by yourself. If you're a pastor, you can't just read the book and then say we're going to be centered because because and, and going to go to the example. So if I'm leading a small group Bible study and I'm seeking to be centered, but the people in the group are very fuzzy, the group is still going to be fuzzy. Or if they're very bounded, it's still going to be bounded. Um, so I advocate for introducing the people to the language, to these concepts so that there can be a shared understanding this is who we are and i yeah not everyone's going to read the book i made a series of five videos to make it easier but yeah introduce people to the concept so then to your purity question if we are if we have this shared sense of we are centered on jesus and that's what it means then i think the belonging belonging a belief coming is not as threatening or problematic because um because there's this clear sense our center our center matters and your orientation to the center matters so whereas yeah a bounded group it's the line and so it's just have you crossed the line or not crossed the line it's neat and you you, you can't have the messiness. But I think if you bring a bounded mentality to a centered church, it can feel like, oh, you don't take belief seriously. Um, but I'd say no, in a centered approach, you could take belief seriously. And if you're articulating, letting people know, I think it's, um, yeah, I think it has greater evangelistic potential because it's not just saying, belonging is enough the people that are visiting they're going to pick up oh it's 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 about orientation to this center that matters it, it does matter I, I mean of course it is that center as you mentioned and what we tried to do is i mean we did have membership as kind of a line of demarcation but it, it just meant you were to a higher standard we still gave people opportunity to belong and to be a part of different things there were certain things that they just couldn't do yet because they weren't committed to the, the, the process, but we would give room. And again, not that ours was a perfect system and it was one that we were always working with and trying to tweak. And I, I particularly, it was, it was a challenge for me when I first got there, just because I'd come from a bounded set church and that's what I was used to. And we were in counting situations. We were in the, in the city. And when you encounter people in the city, you, you just see it more openly. And I think more frequently 
than you do in suburbia where it's much more covered and you 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 can hide behind a deep I mean a veneer and I I do wonder when you're looking at this centered set approach do you see any differentiation between cultures how they go about this like in a as you've written on honor shame Yes. I think of an Asian culture yep. where it's much more a higher. I mean, even though being from Honduras, is that more of an honor shame cultural? Well, it's, it's more honor shame um, than here in the United States, not as much as Asia. But yes, yeah, certainly um, it would be lived out in different ways because, yeah, what living confrontation that might work without disintegrative shaming in suburban United States might be deeply shaming in a disintegrative way in, you know, Japan or Thailand or something like that. Um, so it, I think the, yeah, and, and Hebert developed this in India. I mean, so it's, it's not a Western bound concept, but I think the application of it um, would will vary in different cultural settings. We, we were going to talk about this in the beginning, but we didn't get a chance to. Tell us about who Paul Hebert is. We've re referred to his name a couple of times. I know many in our audience are not going to be familiar with him, but he's a pretty amazing thinker in his insights, though he's with Jesus now. His insights yes. are still permeating across many within the mission. Uh, I mean, I would say missiology specifically, but just people, how they're going about church and in, in the Western context too. These are ideas that he gave are, are pretty um, paradigm shifting. Yes. But tell us a bit who Paul Hebert was. Yeah. So the, uh, one neat thing to say, and I, I mean, I dedicated the book to him and my, and my students because he actually, he went to the seminary where I now teach. So um, not, yeah, at the same time or anything, but um, it's, uh, so he, yeah, he, he grew up Mennonite brethren in Kansas and um, went as a missionary to India. And, and yeah, I just, I mentioned Kansas because there he is in India and he's like, okay, you know, you'd have someone, they come and and what's it mean to be a Christian? So in Kansas, it's, well, you accept Jesus as your personal savior, you're a Christian. And so he's in India and, you know, he's talking to someone, would you like to accept Jesus? And they say, yes. And then, you know, he, he goes and visits them and talks to them more and they have Jesus up on their shelf with, you know, their other 10 gods or something. And he's starting to realize, oh, this, this, is this, this language, this way of conceiving, it's not working here. And that was the root of him coming up with bounded, fuzzy, and centered of, of thinking, okay, I need a different way of discerning who's a believer, who belongs in the India context. Um, so, and that, yeah, he went on and did his uh, PhD in cultural anthropology and taught at Fuller Seminary and then later at um, Trinity Deerfield in Illinois. And, and, and I should mention, so we're talking about Paul Hebert in relation to these bounded, fuzzy, and centered. I think, you know, you yeah, it might be to say, oh, Mark Baker, he's all about bounded, centered, and fuzzy. Like, this is one chapter in Paul Hebert's books. So, like, mm. yeah, his work on, you know, contextualization, um, pressing the difference between, yeah, openness to things of the spirit and the spirit world and other parts of the world compared to the West. Like, he's he's done a lot. He did a lot of work in a lot of areas in um yeah, missiology, cultural anthropology, missionary anthropology. So you're talking about the flaw of the excluded middle? Is yes. that what you were talking about? Yeah. For those for those that don't know, that's actually a fascinating thing. In our culture today, actually explain that really quick for people, just this flaw of the, the excluded middle. Yes. Because people are so, like, okay, what are you guys talking about? I want to follow along. Explain it because it really has tremendous effects on us in the West, if, if, for especially for those who are not used to certain things that go on in other cultures, you're going to encounter it if you haven't. <laughs> if you're interacting with anyone from a different culture, usually a first generation, you're inevitably going to encounter it. But go ahead, explain okay. it. And feel th I, like I don't actually remember the language of middle and this, but so feel free to interrupt or or add to this after I'm done. But what I remember is this sense of you you have this clash of um, missionaries. So, so you take a missionary from 
you know, me, suburban New York, and you send them to, uh, you know, East Africa or West Africa, and they go into a village in which, um, you know, the, the realm of the spirits, this is not fantasy there. Like they, they, the, the, the you know, cursing people and, um, you know, whether they call it demons or something, but the spirit world is part of daily life. And so you had this missionary communicating a gospel, which is coming from a intellectual scientific realm. And it is just ignoring not being in touch with this whole other realm of life, which is part of reality, daily life for these people. And Hebert's saying, yeah, we, we are we are missing in a big time way in this um, in this sense of being missionaries if we're not engaging this other realm. That's, I think so, that's a pretty pretty good apt way of putting it. I, I think of in a contemporary set, you've got people like, uh, and we've had him on the show, and though he's with Jesus now, Michael Heiser, who wrote a book called The Unseen Realm and talking about demons and angels. And and people hear that, but it, it's it's interesting that a lot of pastors and a lot of churches don't talk about that. They'll, they'll talk about the religiosity. They'll talk about sin. They'll talk about the cross. But they don't talk about the the powers. They don't talk about spirits and ancestors and and things like that. But other cultures do. And if you yes. don't, then they're going to encounter it. I I have encountered that several different times. And I think there, in some ways, God has allowed the nations to come to us to uh, to be a corrective mm -hmm. uh, here in the West. And I and I've maintained for quite some time that God bringing the nations it's for one of two reasons: either to renew the church or to be reached. It's one of the two things. And yeah. it's interesting. We've been looking at the, the statistics and how Christianity in the West has been declining for some time. But as we record this, we're in the month of April and Easter just passed, but CNN just ran an article on Easter Sunday. And it said the demise of evangelicalism, I think it was, or Christianity in the America was premature. Hmm. And I, I, I went to read the article a little bit defensive, not that I want Christianity to decrease, but having armed with my statistics to show the other the other way, I was pleasantly surprised where they said the demise was premature in that the church is growing because of immigrants and refugees sure. that are coming here from all over the world, but they bring their worldview. And it's yeah. very different from those who are in a in the the majority here in the United States that do not come from a background where spirits and ancestors were car part of the common everyday experience. So he offers a corrective to us. Now we've got a little bit off topic, but it all relates. I mean, this, this idea of how we go about this, how we live this out in our world today as we encounter different people that are in process that held a different worldview than we do. You know, as we're going about this though, and we're doing it, what advice do you have for those 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 leaders that are out there, and, and many of them are pastors that listen to the show, and they say, well, wait a minute, I, I need to research this a little bit more, but I think that's where we'd like to get to, although my church is bounded or it's fuzzy. Yeah. What advice do you give them that are willing to take this centered approach and join this journey to centeredness, knowing that they could full well really isolate and infuriate or frustrate the people that they are in leadership with i want to and this is more a comment to them not advice but a, a, an important observation so in the book i'm seeking to and in our conversation today i'm seeking to make these categories very clear you know bounded fuzzy centered and make them distinct from each other and different um in real life, um, yeah, the, it's it's again messier, and so, uh, and I guess this ends up being advice. So, a piece of advice is don't don't look at and say, oh, you know, we're centered. Like, yeah, Mark, we're with you, great. Or or to say, oh, we're bounded, and what a lousy thing we've got. I I think most churches are either a mix of you know, bounded and centered or fuzzy and centered, or even within a church, you might have, you know, people that are fuzzy and some that are bounded. And so the question is not just, oh, are we bounded? Or are we centered? But I think the question is, how can we become more centered? So my one piece of advice is don't, don't start by we're this or that in a binary kind of way and think, okay, now we've arrived. So one is to constantly be asking, how can we become 
more centered. Um, second thing of advice, and I'd already said this, so I'll just repeat it quickly, is I think it's extremely important to share the concepts with the congregation or with the group you're ministering to so that there's a common sense of understanding this is what we're trying to do. And um, and I think that becomes helpful, not just in bringing people on board with you, but it helps in communication. So then you're in a meeting and, and there's examples of this in the book, you know, but you're in a meeting and, and the leader can say, okay, now remember, we're trying to be centered or some, a situation comes up and you can ask, boy, I don't know, how can we do this in a centered way? And so it, be, it becomes helpful language in helping you become centered. So one is to ask the question, to be constantly asking the question, how can we become more centered? The second is to introduce people to the categories and that can become common language. Um, and then uh, I think a very crucial thing is, yeah, obviously, I think these categories, these concepts are important, valuable tools. Um, but of fundamental importance is who is the God of the center? And so I have a chapter on that in the book because, and you think of it this way, if you are thinking, okay, we're going to become centered, but if most of the people in your group, in your congregation are living a God of conditional love, if their view of God is God is a sort of finger pointing judgmental God, then the church is going to be bounded because their experience, that, 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 concept of God will trump anything you do to try and be centered. So that's why I think it's of extreme importance to make very clear to work at God being the God that's revealed to us by Jesus. So I work with Jesus a lot in the book, both um, as an example of let's learn from Jesus how to be centered, but also learn from Jesus then who is God. So that would be another um, another piece of advice I would give. And then um, I guess lastly, and I, I referred to this before, but to not be thinking of learning, you know, these six or seven different, this is the centered way to do this, the centered way to do this, but to be working at qualities that enable your, your group, your ministry to be centered. So, and I have a chapter on the book on that as well, but, you know, compassion, curiosity, um, creativity, safety, where people can be vulnerable, trust. And that's both my, as a leader, my trust that God is the one that's going to make this happen and trust between people. And then humility um, to, yeah, humility with others that were a work in process. So developing those qualities and that will facilitate the living out of a centered approach. Mm -hmm. Another question I have, and I know you've kind of summarized for us, but I just I can't let go of this question. How do you differentiate working this centered set approach out between a smaller church and a much larger church where the 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 anonymity is just easy to do? And that's why people go there is because of the anonymity. How do you help people do that? Or does this differentiate? Yeah, no, I think um um well let me say this i th I, mean, you, I think your observation is very good and if someone is just a spectator in a large church uh i would i would say it is still valuable to preach teach in a centered way so the language is more centered than bounded or fuzzy. So I wouldn't say, sorry, you know, if the person's just sitting there, that's all they're doing, you can't do this. I'd say, no, it still matters. Like, and so I have a chapter in the book on how to give ethical exhortation in a centered way. And I think it matters how we're talking about these things and preaching and teaching. And people will have different experiences if our talk is more bounded, fuzzy, or centered. Um, but in terms of the diagram, you know, if it's a very large church and someone's 
only sitting there on a Sunday morning, not involved in a small group or something. Yeah, realistically, it's going to be, it is not going to be a full centered experience for them because they're not, they're not journeying with someone. They're not walking with someone. So yeah. And when I did my interviews, I mean, I visited people from some very small church plants and a couple, you know, you have very big churches, one, a multi-site church. And the bigger ones that were working at being at centered, um, it was very clear that their small groups, their weekly meetings were um, of vital importance. And they emphasized that to people. I mean, one of them, even to the point of saying, you know, every couple of months, they would say, if you are not part of, of one of these midweek house groups, um, then maybe this is not the church for you. Maybe you should be, and like, that's a really centered statement, right? I mean, they're not being bounded, like you can't come, but they're not being fuzzy. They're saying, this is who we are. We think this is so important that if you're not going to do this, you know, this might not be the place for you. Mm. So it gives both, gives a degree of flexibility. And, and really that's what the centered approach does. Yes. As you said, it's pointing people to Jesus, helping them take their next step with Jesus, whatever that might be. And I've often joked, we had a guy at one of my churches who was this really rough guy, dedicated servant of Jesus, but he was just rough. He's that old guy at the the church who get off the, get off the chair or, you know, yeah. get off that table and all the kids are afraid of him. Yeah. And I remember a guy leaving the service one time and it was a small Baptist church in, in New England. And uh, he said, if that's a Christian, I don't want to be one. And I, and I've often made the joke. I said, can you imagine what he would be like if he didn't have Jesus? I mean, <laughs> like, like he's, you don't have no idea how far he's come in his journey. Yes. And, and the same with you, you've come with a, a journey. We all had a different journey. We all have another step of obedience to take. We all have that prompting that we need to obey. We all need that community to come around us to help us and and proverbially hold our feet to the fire to to help us take that next step with Jesus. And sometimes we have to give room for that process. Other times we need to to push, knowing that that process has been given enough time and they need to act. And again, this isn't an and this isn't an exact science. This is us working out our salvation with fear and trembling as we seek to be the best kingdom agents that we are to be in the middle of this sinful and broken world. And, and for many of us that are of a certain age uh, or vintage, let's say uh, we've been around a while and we've seen how the culture shifted and we're seeing more and more people coming on to our, our shores, if you will, is very much broken and needing a lot of grace, needing a lot of attention. And for many of us that have grown up in cultures where Christianity was a majority, it was, we could afford to be, I mean, we shouldn't have been, but we did uh, much more of the bounded way. This is who's in, this yeah. is who's out. But as the culture has become much more secularized, it it and we want to reach people and give room for process, especially those coming from either completely non-religious backgrounds whatsoever or a con contra religion. I mean, a totally different religion. They need to have room to process this as well as they're going through this and trying to, to do this. What are some concluding thoughts? We like to tell people, we want to give you a water bottle for the week to, to sip on, to nourish your faith, to water your faith that you might be nourished. What's a concluding thought that we can give to our people about being centered? Yeah, so I I guess, um, I mean, I had my statements just there of advice, but a, a concluding thought, I guess, like, let's go to Jesus. And I mean, Luke 15, to me, is just captures our God revealed by Jesus as living out a centered approach. So my concluding thought is, um, one, to, to picture ourselves as in our hurt, broken state, you know, Jesus invites us to the table as he invited the, the tax collectors, uh, not uh, the tax collectors and sinners to the table. Um, so we are people who are invited and and Jesus desires to embrace us like you know the prodigal son running home that father running out there um willing to sacrifice his own honor to embrace the son so we are welcomed by a god who most desires to include us to bring us into fellowship with others not to shame us and exclude us um, and to recognize 
that this is a God who takes seriously the damage done by that shaming and excluding, and in Luke 15, confronts the scribes and Pharisees who wanted to do that. So, so my concluding thought is both to know you, listener, are a person loved and embraced by Jesus, by the God represented by the Father in that parable, and let us go out and and embrace others who are excluded and include them in the same way that Jesus does in that in that beautiful chapter. Well, that's a great concluding thought, Mark. We appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for the book. I do recommend it to others, but thank you for coming on Apollo's Watered. You're welcome.